All right. Welcome. Thank you for attending today's session, session six, educational tips and strategies for supporting youth as they return to in-person education. A quick moment for housekeeping. I have muted everyone by default, so we won't be disrupted by latecomers. But when you want to talk during the open discussion portion or when asked by the speaker, just click the microphone icon in the bottom bar to mute or unmute yourself. Please have your camera on during this session to meet STC requirements. Feel free to use the raise hand feature by going to the participant icon at the bottom of your screen, which opens up a small window that includes a raise hand icon that you may use to raise a virtual hand. If you have any questions, please place them into the chat at the appropriate time or feel free to raise that virtual hand. Please mute your microphone when you are not speaking. That helps to minimize the presenting underwater sound and any interruptions from barking dogs. When the speaker is talking or sharing their screen, please use the chat box to let me know if you can't see or hear something. I will reply in private chat directly to you. You're welcome to use the chat box throughout. CCR staff and or the presenter will be monitoring and responding verbally or via chat. STC information will be sent out the week after the conference upon verification of attendees present. All sessions are being recorded, however the chat feature will not be captured in the recording. At the end of the conference, you will receive an email with the evaluation link. Please be sure to complete by next Friday, June 18th. And now I have the pleasure of handing it over to Chief Jennifer Branning from Lassen County. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone. What an amazing conference this has been thus far. Educational success and positive school engagement are extremely important to improving education and outcomes for our foster youth. Focusing on supporting all youth who find change disruptive will be important, which brings us to today's topic, st strategies and tips for supporting youth as they return to in-person education. This session will be presented by Elizabeth Clues, Youth Advocate, Kimberly Faulkner Camacho, Coordinator 3 Technical Assistance Program for the Los Angeles County Office of Education, Foster Youth Services Coordinating Program, Michelle Lustig, Program Director for the Foster Youth Technical Assistance Program with Los Angeles County Office of Education, Callie Oxford, Foster Youth Services Program Ma Manager with Lassen County. Please find more information on our speakers and their biography. And with that, I'll turn it over to our first presenter, Kim. Thank you, Chief Branning. I'm going to share my screen so that we can get started here. Let's see here. Okay, can everyone see that? Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Um, it, it's a pleasure to be here really because I come from a law enforcement background. I'm happy to be amongst probation staff and just really share my experiences in education and how they correlate to working with probation officers and students on probation. As a kid, my father worked in Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall in Los Angeles County, and I thought it was pretty cool. And then he moved on to become a probation officer, a school-based probation officer. And I remember thinking, wow, dad, that's, that's really cool that you get to be at a school and help kids in a school setting, but he wasn't the counselor. And then he went on to be a supervisor for LA County Probation in the juvenile, uh, in, a juven in the school-based services unit. And so I thought I was going to be a probation officer. I majored in criminal justice, but at the time I worked for the city of Compton Parks and Recreation Department. And what I thought was, you know what, why don't I do something where I can help kids maybe before they get to that point? Not realizing really at the time that once you work at a school, you will have kids that come to you on probation. But I was talking to my dad and I said, well, dad, I don't really wanna do this now. I think I wanna be a school counselor instead of a probation officer at a school. So either way he supported me. Uh, my mom is a psychologist at one of the California state prisons. And so a lot of our conversation around uh, Thanksgiving and other times are just about how we help people in the community, how we help kids. And it's pretty much been like that my entire life. So I'm really honored to be here before you today. Uh, my husband works for Orange County Probation Department. So it's kind of all through, you know, my, my everyday um, life. And my dad, he's retired about two years ago. 
So moving forward, as Chief Branning said, our presenters to you today, myself and Dr. Lustig, my amazing partner with Los Angeles County Office of Education, another amazing and outstanding person that you're going to hear from today, Elizabeth Clues. Uh, she's going to provide your perspective from the youth voice perspective. And then the awesome Callie from Lassen County. She's going to really talk to you about how to connect in Lassen County or in other counties just to provide services for the youth that you work with. And so today we are going to definitely talk about students on probation, but also students in foster care. As you heard in the beginning, uh, we work in the foster youth services uh, program and we work with a lot of students who are systems involved youth. And so we just want to talk about our experiences and how to support those youth, how we can work together to support them. We will also define trauma and grit. You know, oftentimes we hear about trauma and resilience, and we're going to talk about resilience, but we're going to talk about that trauma and then how we help students develop that grit that they need as they transition back to school or the, the grit that they needed to identify and develop even before COVID. We're also going to talk, talk about the impact of negative labels and just how some of our everyday language that we may not realize that we're using, how it impacts our students and the decisions they make, as well as just the stereotypes that just exist that sometimes serve as a barrier to their success. And so in the process, we're going to redefine GRIT using an acronym. And then we'll jump into Elizabeth's story where she gets to share with you information just about her lived experience, hoping that you can find some takeaways as a probation staff that you can, takeaways that you can use to help improve outcomes for the youth on your caseload. We'll also talk about educational entitlements. This part of the presentation is really key because oftentimes our youth and their families, they don't realize the entitlements that they have and how, that, how they can benefit from them to be more successful in school. So if you're not familiar with those, pay close attention so that you can take notes and be able to share that with the youth you work with as well as, well as their families. And last but not least, Lassen County, we're gonna hear from them, the amazing work that they're doing and how you can utilize them if they're in your county or how you can contact other uh, county foster youth services programs. And so this here is just an overview of foster youth in California. California is really large. And as you can see here, we have 60,000 youth in foster care. Regardless of the number, you know, whether it's 10 youth or 60,000 youth, just the thought of being removed from your parents and having to live with someone else is just traumatic alone. And so with those 60,000 youth, we, our child welfare partners, schools, probation staff, we, have to work together to help those youth because they don't have parents anymore. As wards of the court, how do we communicate? How do we effectively come together to help them improve outcomes? I have LA County here, not just because I'm from LA County, but LA County is unique. We have 33,000 youth in foster care and we have over half of the population in the state. And so working with our probation staff is key. Working with our child welfare staff is just so important to help those students, to help the staff that work with those students because the staff that work with these students are doing some amazing work and sometimes it can get a bit challenging. And so how, when it gets challenging, how do we tap into the different resources around us? Like those wraparound services, how do we work together? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. What we also have here is just some point in time data from October 2020 that shows there were 2,162 youth in foster care on probation. And so that may seem like a small percentage, but those students have a huge impact on a lot of the data that we see when it comes to incarceration rates, students on probation, students being suspended, students experiencing trauma, just a lot of that. Those, the, those youth with that double dual status, they, they have so much that they're trying to deal with. And many of them probably haven't really had a chance to process the trauma, you know, just the, the shock of being in both systems and how do they deal with that as a youth. And so, what I want to talk to you about today is why you matter. As a probation officer, you matter so much. And, and I don't just see it because my dad was a probation officer. I, I had the unique 
opportunity to work in the probation office in LA County. So when I came to Foster Youth Services, I was a counselor in the residential based services office. And I was able to work under Director Felicia Davis and Adam Bettino in LA County. And I worked with their probation officers to really help them get an understanding of how to effectively help the students on their caseloads with their educational needs. You know, they were doing a great job of some of the other things. And they said, how do we help our students? How do we help bridge that gap that exists between us being able to communicate with schools, with us telling the families what they need to help their youth be successful when they um, leave the STRTP, when they come off probation, you know, and so helping them to understand their role as being a liaison in between both the school and the families and, and the youth and helping them to see how they can connect the dots, you know, and probation officers, they tend to be that supportive adult in the kid's life. You know, some kids, they may not have anyone in their life that they see as someone who's supportive, someone who's there. As a probation officer, you're going to be there. You, you have to be there and you're going to help the student try their best to meet the conditions of their probation. But that relationship is so powerful and it means so much because for some students, there's no one else. So connecting them to other people who can be a positive role model is key as well. But in, in my opinion, from what I've seen as a kid growing up and what I've seen firsthand in the office, working side by side with probation officers and even the conversations I have with my husband about how to support the youth in the halls, I, I just think it's a really, really um, great thing to be in this position to support them. The kids may see it as, oh man, you know, I'm on, I'm on probation. Like, I don't want to deal with you. Or these are some of the things my, my dad would tell me, but he really took it upon himself to be the probation officer slash guidance counselor slash coach slash mentor slash role model for a lot of these kids who just didn't have that. Even when he worked in the gang unit, his role was to never give up on these kids regardless of what everyone else sees around them. And he, he was proud of that role that he had. So I saw that a lot growing up and it really shaped who I became as a school counselor. And so you also have the ability to connect students to resources like mental health counseling, like things that they need in school. You know, and some schools are able to provide the mental health counseling. Some schools not, they, they can, it may take a little longer or there's a long referral process. When students are on probation, when you start to pull out the positives, you know, they're able, you're able to connect them to those mental health services that they needed that probably led up to, you know, why they are where they are. You know, some students who who were having challenges with mental health, being able to get that mental health counseling from a clinical psychologist or someone that can help them, it's possible that it can help students uh, be more proactive so that those mental health challenges don't meet, lead to mental health issues, um, illnesses, you know, helping students to take care of their needs that weren't getting met before they were on probation. So while some students and families may see it as a negative, you are in a position to help them to see the positives. Look, we're able to get family counseling. Look, we're able to really sit with you and get that one-on-one -on -one help that you need so that I can talk to the counselor about your, your transcript. Now we have to take a deep dive and look at this transcript and say, hey, you're missing all these credits. And to get off probation, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And so working with the student and the family to do that. The career development that students are able to get access to, some of the career fairs that that have been set up by YDS in LA County and, and other places to help students get that access where sometimes they're in school and they feel like, ah, I don't know who to go to. I don't wanna to talk to the counselor. I don't want them to know my business. Well, the probation officer knows all the business. And so being able to say, hey, you, there's nothing you have to hide from me. So how are we gonna do this? How are we going to work together? And doing that, you contribute to their resilience. You help them to develop grit, which is what we'll talk about a little bit later. On this next slide, I pulled it from the CPOC website. And what I like about it is that it shows the decline over a nine, 10 year period. It shows how in 2000, the pop was really high. You know, it says there are 19,000 students that were um, in detention. You know, it, we were heavy on incarceration at the time. And as you can see the decrease over a period of time, when the probation department started to implement evidence-based strategies to 
um, improve outcomes for these youth, to not have so many youth um, locked up and to find other ways to meet students where they are. And, and I say students a lot because I'm coming from educational background, but students, youth, to, to meet them where they are. And so as you see the pop start to decrease, we know that there became an increase in, in caseloads. And so looking at your caseload and trying to decide, okay, students aren't being locked up, but how many kids are in my caseload? How can I effectively help these youth? Because some youth who were being locked up for some of the smaller things, that was an additional trauma. You know, I, I remember going into the halls and working with CSEC youth. I remember working with a youth who, he was locked up because he stole something to support his family. He said, you know, miss, I know what I did was wrong. He said, but we hadn't eaten in a long time. And I, my brothers and sisters needed to eat. So yeah, I stole the food, you know, and I got locked up. Like everyone's story is a little bit different, but looking at a kid like that and providing a kid like that with guidance instead of locking that up. So I'd love to see the decrease. And today I just would love to add to tips and strategies about how you can work with youth on your caseload or work with your probation officers to really improve outcomes for them and just help them along this, this difficult journey to be flexible with them and help them to see how important they are, despite what it says on this record to help them to see that that doesn't have to define them. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lustig, and we're just going to review a video about a young woman who shares her journey of being in foster care. Being taken from place to place and, and being sent to a whole new different city and a whole new different family and people that you've never met before, it's a really confusing experience. You just feel torn away from your community. It's like just imagine that you are going to work one day and it's just a normal day and you're on your way to work and everything is as it's supposed to be and you watered your dog and you drink your coffee and you tell your kids goodbye and you go to work and then the police show up at your job and they say, okay, we're moving you to a totally different city and you don't know anybody and you, you can't call your family and you can't call any of your friends and you need to leave your phone here and you can't take any of your stuff with you. We're gonna, we'll figure that out later and they just pick you up and they transport you to a totally different place and then tell you to just wait in this room for a little while because we're going to figure things out and then they come and bring you a little sack lunch in and it's oh just a few more hours and we're going to figure this out just here play with this this little toy okay put this little ring on a hook and then they send you to these these really well-meaning people who but you have no idea who they are and their house smells different and maybe they have a dog and they have hardwood floors you've only ever had carpet like everything about the experience is alien to you and all you want is to be able to contact the people that you have a bond with it's a very disrupting experience and in a lot of ways, it's a traumatic experience because all of these things are unexpected and suddenly everything in your world that you felt was safe and secure and concrete is not. And having those ideas shattered is really difficult, especially as a child, because you need that security. You need to know that here's my bed, I can come home to it, and this is where it's going to be, and that's going to be okay. Or here's my mom, and no matter what, she's going to be there for me, and I can just call her and she'll show up, and that's going to be okay. When you can't believe that anymore, it starts to make you question, well, what can you believe? Who can you trust? What is a for sure thing? You begin to stop valuing certain things. You stop valuing relationships because they're not concrete and they're not going to be there forever. And you stop investing yourself in certain things. And all of a sudden, stability isn't really important to you. Having goals isn't important to you. You are concerned with where are you going to sleep tonight? Are you going to be safe? Who are these people? Doing a simple thing like taking a shower in a stranger's home is a very disconcerting experience. So the more that you get moved around, the more trauma that you endure in that. Every single move is a traumatic experience. So you can see the consequences later on. And really you can see the consequences pretty early on. As a child who's in foster care, I exhibited signs of not being able to trust other people, of not wanting to connect. I had some really antisocial behavior. I also had a deep dislike for government agencies, for the police, for social workers. Like I did not believe that they were on my team because when I'm telling you that this is what I need and you're just not listening and you're saying, well, th this is what we feel you need. I can't trust you any longer. 
As a child, you do not have the capacity to forward think. It, it, you are not able to. And, and scientifically, your brain isn't even wired to do that yet. And so the decisions that you're making are pure emotional. When you're dealing with a traumatic situation and when the people around you don't have the tools to help you deal with that, the decisions that you're making are pure instinctive. And so I just know that if I have this incredible amount of sadness and this incredible amount of fear and I don't know what to do with it, well, well, maybe I should just run away. Maybe I should do drugs. Maybe I should get in fights. Maybe I should cuss out my foster parents. There's all kinds of different things that happen. None of those things were planned. All of those things were unintended consequences because I didn't know how to deal with the original emotions that I was facing. And so I really just want people to understand that these kids just need help. I don't understand how there's so much funding for foster care benefits, for adoption benefits, for emergency shelters. There's so much funding for that, but there's no funding for family preservation. And had my mom just had a little bit of help, had she have had enough money to buy her own vehicle, had she had had enough money to relocate herself from an abusive situation, had she not had to depend on men in the first place for any kind of financial stability, I don't believe that she would have made some of the decisions that she would have made. I don't believe that she would have struggled as a mother because my mom is a good mom. She just had some hardships and she had nobody to help her. And so I don't understand how there's so much funding to take us away, but there's no funding to keep us there. Thank you, Kim. I love this video in particular when we are speaking with folks who are um, working with departments of probation. Um, clearly, this young woman is currently incarcerated. We don't know if she was duly involved as a child, but when you are working with young people who are, are transitioning from the 300 to the 600 side and are moving from foster care into probation or remaining duly involved, um, it's super important for us to understand that those were those children's experiences when they were removed from their homes and they're coming to you um, as a probationer, holding all of that trauma and all of those experiences inside. So um, please feel free to unmute yourself if you're comfortable doing so. Um, raise your hand as was um, and as you got the guidance to on the screen or enter in the chat. What were your first thoughts after listening to Michelle's description? And, and what would the impact be if she were a duly involved youth? What, what, how would that play out for her, do you think? It's gonna be a quiet group, Kim. Can I make a comment, Michelle? Of course. Um, I think one uh, takeaway that I had from the video um, was that I just, I really saw her as an individual person who had, you know, in individual circumstances. And it felt like she was treated with kind of a one size fits all um, approach, which I imagine um, happens to foster youth a lot. And, um, maybe those who are on probation as well. Thank you, Elizabeth. Greg, it sounds like you'd like to add a comment. Yes, thank you. Hello, everybody. I was just uh, thinking, you know, as, as she was describing the, her experience through her eyes, it it's, uh, was very powerful because it's something that all of us uh, who uh, have worked in uh, the foster care industry, either uh, mostly through probation, but um, also being mindful of, of experiences through child welfare also, uh, it was very powerful. And those, those little things that she mentioned about just the hardwood floors and those types of things are, are incredible things for us to be mindful of. Um, and uh, I know, you know, statewide probation has done so much work and emphasis on being trauma informed and, and, and that we continue to look through that lens uh, in the work that we do. 
And, uh, you know, I, I would trust and hope that child welfare is doing the same. Um, with that said, uh, I, I thought uh, her experiences were, um, were really important. Um, another thing uh, that I did want to highlight is not all, every county in California is dual, dual jurisdiction county. Um, some, some counties are and some counties are not. And so um, if, if it's a, like uh, Monterey County, we're not a dual jurisdiction county. And so we may have a youth who had been uh, placed in foster care through child welfare and, and uh, sustained uh, criminal offenses to uh, the point after a 241 that warranted probation jurisdiction. And probation takes over the entire full case. And uh, it's so important that uh, we have all of these uh, things, we're being mindful of those experiences. And again, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of uh, being trauma informed. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, I was a social worker in San Diego during the no dual jurisdiction and then worked in education while we had juris a dual jurisdiction. So definitely there are, are different ways of that playing out through across the state. Um, just reviewing some of the comments in the chat that she did great, um, asking how you would all feel being plucked out of your environment. We often think that, you know, we, we focus on the fact that kids are being rescued to some extent, to large extent, when they enter foster care, but that their entire world shifts and even abusive circumstances that are familiar are predictable to some extent and familiar. And familiar always sort of feels better than the unknown. That's a human quality. Um, seeing uh, she made her experience relatable um, and that it's a powerful video. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. You can continue to add those if you'd like, um, but we will move on for the sake of time. So um, just a, a sort of common definition of trauma in general, we think about trauma and trauma exposure as experiencing or being exposed to an event where we perceived ourselves to be, uh, to have our life threatened or that we might be subjected to significant bodily harm or those that we cared about might be um, the actual experiencing of those um, events and, and the resulting impact of them. Next slide, Kim. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder and the resulting impact of trauma is seen at an incredibly high rate when we are looking at young people who are incarcerated. There have been numerous studies uh, in the United States around the percentage of young people who are in juvenile detention facilities, juvenile halls and camps, and how many of them experienced abuse or neglect. Oftentimes in my experience in, in these fields, I found that we have a lot of kids on probation who were never rescued from those abusive backgrounds by the foster care system, by public child welfare. Instead, they continued um, in those homes, they began to commit offenses, eventually were adjudicated, having never had their primary abuse or neglect addressed. And so um, to recognize that when you see that almost 100% of young people in this study had experienced at least one childhood trauma, um, you can really see the impact on those exposures as they move through their childhood into latency and adolescence, and then um, obviously carrying those traumas and the resulting behavioral responses and mental health responses and physical responses well into their adulthoods. Um, so when you're looking at, um, at the young people on your caseload, it's important to recognize that nearly all of them will have been um, subjected to some type or multiple types of traumatic experiences in their childhood. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is just some of those um, statistics from the study. We also know that the more ACE exposure, the more adverse childhood experience exposure you have prior to age 18, the more of these events you have experienced and lived through, the higher the likelihood of you having really negative outcomes, both in your adolescence and in your adulthood. 
Um, when you have six or more traumatic experiences, the likelihood of you being an intravenous drug user, the likelihood of you being an alcohol or a drug, a drug addicted, the likelihood of you becoming incarcerated, having significant health impacts, um, or attempting or successfully completing suicide are exponentially increased. The more your trauma exposure, the more negative impact it has. And the more likely you are to be vulnerable to continued victimization um, and, and traumatization, which is why we see this high number of young people who have been system involved, involved in commercial sexual exploitation of children and other types of exploitation. Next slide, please. The ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, listed these 10 exposures, these 10 life events as the primary uh, adverse experiences that would lead to a traumatic outcome and impact. Um, but we know that there are more than these, but these are the ones when we are talking about ACE exposure that we are talking about. And obviously for children who are in the foster care system, you are talking about children who have often had many of these um, impacts. And when we are talking about children who are also in the probation system or solely in the probation system, we can, we can know that they've um, often had all of those same exposures. Next slide, please. There was an additional study that we want to make people aware of, um, and that was the Philadelphia Urban ACE study. So it looked at not only um, those initial 10, but added an additional five indicators. What is also really important is when we talk about the findings of the original ACE study, that two thirds of all participants had at least one ACE exposure, we need to note that that was done by Kaiser Permanente for Kaiser members. And that Kaiser members by and large are white middle-class employed individuals. And they are in no way, shape or form representative of the demographic of our entire country. So when we are looking at that population and the exposure to ACEs, and then we take this deeper dive into an urban environment, which was largely um, citizens of color, largely people living in more um, urban in an urban environment with much more exposure to um, neighborhood and community uh, traumas and, and violence, you see this incredible increase in the percentage of people within that study who were exposed to at least one ACE. The five additional indicators are listed here, experiencing racism, witnessing violence, living in an unsafe neighborhood, living in foster care or experiencing bullying. And you can see um, the increase in exposure to more than one or one or more um, of these ACE experiences. Next slide, please. We are educators, Kim and I, and, and our partners in Cali and Lassen. Um, we are looking always at how all of these experiences um, affect and impact both education and academic outcomes for our students. What study after study has found is that the higher the ACE exposure, the more likely children are to have problematic behaviors in school, increases in suspension and discipline, um, expulsions, lower academic achievement. What is so important for us to understand about trauma exposure is that there are literally physiological brain changes, chemical changes within the body that take place and neurons that, that fire differently and chemicals that course through the body that disrupt and interrupt learning and memory and the functions that we are that we have to rely on in order to acquire knowledge and maintain that knowledge so that it's foundational as we are being taught new constructs, new concepts, new information. Children who are exposed to trauma will struggle in school because they have missed pieces of learning while they were being traumatized. Their brain couldn't focus on what was happening in the classroom. Their brain was preoccupied, as you heard in the video, with primary thoughts of safety and survival. And in this moment, 
how they were going to be okay. And so you see the higher uh, ACE exposure, higher trauma exposure, having increased impacts on a child's learning and their academic achievement. Next slide, please. I think I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Kim. Thanks, Michelle. So when you think about the students on your caseload and you look at the list here of youth most affected by trauma, you know, there are a lot of students who are affected by it, but research shows that these youth listed here are most impacted by it. You know, our students in foster care, of course, our, our court involved youth, but our students in foster care, those experiencing homelessness, experiencing poverty, witnessing domestic violence, as you look at this list, you can unmute yourself or leave in the chat, but I'm curious to know, when you think about the experiences of youth on your caseload, what percentage of, of them fall into one or more of these student groups? You know, how many of the youth that have come to you on probation were fought in foster care or, you know, you know that they were experiencing homelessness? What we tend to find in education is that when we look at the data within the data, we will start to see some patterns. We start to see the data tell a story about the experiences and the ACEs that our students have, have experienced prior to being, as a result of being in one of these categories. When we look at our students um, in lower socioeconomic status groups, we were able to see some other you know, uh, factors that may make it challenging for them in school. It doesn't mean that it's not possible for them to succeed, but these challenges these challenges that our students face to no fault of their own, because remember they're kids, they're not born into, they're not born with, oh, okay, you're, you're, you're born and you have this amazing job and you can take care of yourself as an infant. Our kids depend on their parents. They're depend, they depend on the adults around them to support them, to provide them with their basic needs. And when those basic needs are not met, you start to see that they, they experience a lot of different um, ACEs and it's not their fault. But as they get older, it starts to appear that it's their fault. We, we say, you know, you're old enough, you know better. But they don't have a choice in the matter when it comes to living in a homeless shelter, witnessing domestic violence, being in foster care, that's not their fault. So how do we continue to, to work with them to help them to get through this? And like I said earlier, being able to provide them with the mental health uh, counseling, the wraparound services is so key when working with these students. I see here we have um, 80 to 95 percent. We have high percentage, 100 percent, 85, very high percentages of history of trauma and referrals contact with child welfare, even if it did not rise to the level of removal in foster care. Yes, you know, unfortunately, our students are experiencing this a lot. So I just wanted to ask that question because we, we, we know what happens, as Michelle just talked about the different ACEs and, and the more ACEs you have and the additional challenges that it leads to. You know, it's no surprise sometimes when we think about the, the issues and the challenges that come with the students who show up on our caseloads or when we work in school, some of our students who have more behavior challenges. But being trauma-informed means having a different lens when we look at that behavior and not really looking at them like they're the problem, moving away from what's wrong with you to what happened to you really helps us to reframe things. And as the probation department has done, to not really, to not lock up so many kids and to have kids on caseloads to provide them with those services and interventions that they need to help them be more successful in society so that we're able to intervene before they're adults. And so now I'm going to ask you to fill out um, a quick poll on Mentimeter. Michelle's going to drop a link in the chat. And I would like for you to use one word and you can use up to three, but how would you define grit? When we talk about those students, they've been through a lot, but some of them have the ability to bounce back. Some of them have grit. Some of them ha need help in developing that grit to help them to get through it. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, uh, click on the link and I'm going to I'm sorry here, I'm going to share my screen. And as you start to enter your answers, and if you can't access it through the link, you can go to menti.com and I'll give you the code. Let's see here. So if you're able to access that, let's see. And if for some reason you can't, you go to www.menti.com. 
and the code, oh, okay, I see them popping up. Code three zero eight six 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 five five. So you can do either or. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the results as they start to pop up. But when we think about grit and who defines grit for us, everyone's definition of grit tends to be different. You know, and so as our students are going through this and, and we're saying, oh, you know, hopefully they can bounce back and be more resilient. If only they had a little more grit. What exactly does that mean when we're talking about a group of students who've experienced a lot of trauma, who need help, who are in need of supportive adults like yourself and others? What does that mean? And so, as you can see here, and I'm looking at another screen, but I see strength is out there a lot. Definitely resilience, perseverance, um, excellent, excellent word choice that you guys are using. And I think that this is important, and I'm going to stop sharing again. Let's see, new share. Let's see, I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth here with our presentation. All right, and so as we talk about our students who experience grit, our students on probation, you know, do they have it? Or, or do they not is the question. And we can work with them on developing that grit. I'm so sorry, I'm sharing my screen again. Just bear with me just a second here. Okay, here we go. And so as you can see, some of the words that popped up, we see some of them here. So that grit that we talk about, that tendency to sustain interest and effort towards long-term goals, it's gonna happen over time. Like we saw perseverance, we saw resilience on there. You know, and exactly what does this mean when we're working with, with our students? You know, some feel like it's, it's that extra effort because again, it's over a period of time. But when we're looking at our students on probation and, and on our caseload, how are we helping them to develop that grit? You know, do we highlight the fact that some students are taking extra buses just to get to a better school, you know, um, and they continue to get up. They may not get up every morning, but we're taking baby steps. You know, how are we highlighting some of those small wins? How are we helping them to point out, you know, what you're doing something, you know, but we if they don't tend to have it, how do we work with them to develop it? You know, this word is so subjective because it's hard to say if someone has it or not. You know, because like I said, everyone's definition of it is different. But for our youth on probation, for our systems involved youth, helping them to tap into that grid. And some of them, they do. They have it. It's there. It just shows up a little different than some of the ways that we define it. But when students feel like the only way that they can demonstrate grit is if they graduate and go to a four-year university. You know, there's so many other ways that we can show students, help them define success so that we can help them see what it is along the way as they set those goals and work with them to um, create those goals. You know, what it says about grit is that an individual with grit, they approach achievement like as a marathon. You know, they, they have this stamina and they go through it over a period of time, but what is that achievement? And so as you're working with students on your caseload, helping them to have that uh, growth mindset versus a fixed mindset, when it's fixed, some students will say, you know what, like, well, I tried and it didn't work. You know, well, good thing there are a lot of different ways that we can try this. You know, when some students feel like, well, I was successful at it because I'm just good. That's that fixed mindset, helping them to see over a period of time, how do I work with you? How, how do you work to get better? How do you grow? How do you continue to show up to our meetings? How do you be proactive about your education or your goals or going to your counselor or doing some things on your own and using the support around you to succeed. So we're going to jump, we're going to go into that a little bit more. But I just want to point out that there are a lot of uh, interventions and strategies that can be implemented in order to develop grit. But it's the quality and the interactions of those uh, interventions, not the strategies themselves that matter the most. And like I said, you matter. You matter so much to these youth. You know, your words matter. Your actions matter so much to them. And all of that, it helps to develop grit in students who may not have that grit. But when we're talking about grit and we're talking about who defines grit, some students have it, but it may not be highlighted. When we talk about trauma, um, I love this quote here, addressing trauma without discussing the racial biases that have great, I'm sorry, without discussing the racial biases that have caused the overrepresentation of youth and color 
in court risk the implication that youth of color are system involved because of family problems rather than the system, the system's biases. And so I have that here because as we talk about developing grit, as we talk about those traumatic experiences, as we go back to the Philadelphia ACE study, we see that experiencing racism was identified as an ACE, that it's, it's a barrier for some, and it's traumatic, you know, and how do we address, how do we, we do an overhaul to some systems and not just this system, education system, health system, uh, justice system. There's so many systems that, that need an overhaul. And I understand we are working and doing our best to work with our youth, but helping them to see that they are resilient when no one else told them they were resilient before, because for the students I've worked with on probation, they have felt like, you know what, miss, like people don't see me that way, or I understand you're trying to be positive, but they, they start to feel defeated sometimes. But I love working with the probation officers to, to highlight their resilience, to point out that grit, to help them to see things that no one told them before. And so the reason I'm bringing up the racial biases is because if they exist and those biases are there and we're not aware of them, they could also prevent us from being able to see those positive things in students that they need to hear about in order to develop the, the grit in order to move forward. Going back to the biases, when we look at data, data speaks. And so this here, I want you to take a look at this information and it's from the Department of Juvenile Justice. It's from the Haywood Burns Institute Center of Juvenile Justice and Criminal Justice, as well as the California Alliance of youth and community justice. And as you look at the next two slides, as I compare the data from uh, youth in the Department of Juvenile Justice and look at the statistics of students who suspended in California, both in the general ed population and the foster youth population, I want you to look at the overrepresentation of students of color. I want you to look at the overrepresentation of black students and we're gonna have a conversation about this. And as you think about the students on your caseload and how students end up there and, and what we can do different to support these students and, and to decrease the overrepresentation of students of color, that's a conversation that's not going to be solved today, but it's definitely a conversation that we need to continue to have and uh, not hide from. And so on, I'm sorry, let me go back to this. So on this uh, chart here, what you see is it says 5.1 times more, black youth are 5.1 times more likely to be referred to probation. You know, and, and I love how they put the colors here so they show that it stands out. Our Latino youth, one and a half times more likely than their white peers to be referred to probation. You know, and there are a lot of reasons that we can come up with, but as we look at this data, it's so important to look at how that data is similar to students who are being suspended from school. When we talk about the school, to pipe the 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 school to prison pipeline, it's so important to look at this data. I want you to take a look at how some student groups only make up a certain percentage of students enrolled, but look at their suspension rates. When you look at African-American students who make up 5% of the general ed population or 18% of students in foster care, our Hispanic youth, 55% of the youth in foster care, 46% percent of students suspended. Look at these numbers of students being suspended. The question is, is it fair? And this overrepresentation, what what do we do about it? I'd love to have a conversation just about the similarities we saw in the data from the juvenile justice, uh, the juvenile justice data compared to the school suspension data. Like what really stood out to you as you think about that data, as you think about the youth on your caseload, as you think about the steps you're taking to um, decrease the overrepresentation of kids of color on your caseload. And also, please feel free to share what role do stereotypes and racial biases play in the overrepresentation of youth of color in the juvenile justice system? So feel free to leave your thoughts in the chat or unmute yourself so that we can have a conversation. And as, as you look at that data, is that data alarming to you? Um, 
have you tried to address the overrepresentation? What steps have you taken to to combat that overrepresentation of youth of color, maybe on your caseloads or in the system, or that we we see um, in the schools? And so as we think about those thoughts and share them or not share them, I just think this is really important because the ACEs have a traumatic impact on our students. And we can't talk about trauma without talking about the impact of racial trauma or the role that racial biases play in our students uh, ending up in the system. And so when our students are there and we look at students going on to college or we look at the graduation rates, this has a ripple effect on other data that we see. Working with students in foster care, we continue to look at the overrepresentation of students of color in foster care. Uh, one important study that we didn't really highlight today, but there's a study that points out how social workers referred, <clears throat> how social workers removed students of color from the home more than a white students. And so what happened is whether the social worker was black or or it didn't matter the race. The biases that exist resulted in them removing more students from home, from being with their parents. And we know about that traumatic impact, how we tell students about stranger danger, how we tell students to stay away from strangers, but then they end up in foster care and we ask them to adjust. And then we start to see behavior problems. And some of those behavior problems eventually result in them being in both systems. And so again, this has a ripple effect on our students and it's negatively, not just negatively impacting our students, but impacting our entire community. And so when we talk about labeling, um, I'd love for you to go back to your Mentimeter. So if you could click on that link again, and I'd love for you to share how are students on probation and in foster care negatively labeled in society and on school campuses? And so, Michelle, if you could share that link one more time. I'm going to share that screen with you again. Let's see here. And so I see some of you, let's see, troublemakers, problems, trouble, rough, raw. Yes, these are some of the negative labels that exist for our students. And we're just gonna talk about how that impacts them and those, those labels that our students are dealing with and to no fault of their own. When they try to, I see more here, uh, watched. As they go through our system, talking to their staff on probation, trying to keep hope, keep faith, it's really important that we help them combat those negative labels that exist. Hold on, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to share my screen again. Let's see here. Okay, here we go. And so the reason I have that is because we're gonna show a quick video just about labeling and what that looks like and some of those labels that you shared and how they show up um, on our students and we'll have a conversation about it.
know, what did you think about that video? What did you think about the negative labels that you saw? What did you think about his reaction when he saw his grade and gave himself his own label? Um, can you think of any students on your case, though, that may have had experiences like this? And because of the grit that they have, they were able to have a different outcome than what maybe society thought they would have had. Please feel free to share your thoughts about what stood out in the video or just the impact of negative labels um, on the students on your caseload. Can I make a comment? Yes. Um, I thought it was interesting how at the beginning of the video, you could see that he starts out um, like in a really good in a really good mood. He's saying good morning to people. And you can just see as, you know, throughout the day or throughout the video, like the more labels that he gets, just kind of the more um, down he becomes. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, like, so what happens is in our schools, sometimes our youth on probation, they come to our schools and, and I like to talk to schools a lot about those negative labels and working with them to think about their language and have trauma-informed language when working with all students. Our students on probation deserve the same time and respect as any other student in the school. And so I love working with probation officers to have those conversations about when students go to their school, how do you connect them with uh, a positive person? How do you have those conversations with the counselors about making sure, the counselors or teachers, about helping them to tap into their resilience as well? When we think about labels, this stood out to me, a thug, a traumatized human unable to grieve. What if we looked at that term that way and we think about our students who have not had the opportunity to grieve, whether it's the loss of a loved one or just the loss of just not having the right type of childhood. There's so many losses that our students would like to grieve and haven't had a chance to grieve and they're on our caseloads and they're in our schools trying to deal with this on their own. So I just have that as just another way to look at the word thug and, and what it means as we look at some of the youth who are, are dealing with a lot of this. And so as we redefine grit, some things that you can do with your students is to help them set goals. I know they have condi conditions they have to meet um, as terms of their probation, but helping them to set those academic goals and, and maybe not assuming that it's gonna happen with a school counselor. It's great to be able to communicate with them, to tell them what their needs are, but some students have never set goals. So teaching them how to set those goals and identifying areas of personal growth. You know, what are some ways that they can grow? Hey, your, your attendance was low. You went to school uh, three days this week instead of two, that's growth. Oh, now you've gone four days a week. Just helping them to highlight the little things and then teaching them uh, self-regulatory skills. Like if they are learning mindfulness to highlight that, if they learn trauma-informed yoga, just getting them to go back to some of those breathing techniques and why all of that is important. And then doing things to contribute to their growth daily. If it's not you, how are we setting, how are we connecting the student to others around them, the teachers, a coach, someone in the community that's going to pour back into them and contribute to that growth on a daily basis. In the chat, put A or B. If you could choose a plant, if someone said, I'm gonna give you a plant, which one would you like? Would you choose A or would you cho choose B? Just put the letter um, in the chat that you would choose. So I see most people are, are putting B. Yes, we would put B. But the reason I have that here is because our students on probation, our students in foster care, they tend to be the B. I love that, Deborah, you say you love a challenge. They tend to be that student that's um, the A student. But what happens when you, as the probation officer, when you are um, pouring back into that student, when you represent that water that's helping with that growth, we know that helping them tap into grit, it's going to happen over a period of time. So through words of encouragement, through the constant meetings that you're having with them, you will start to see growth over a period of time. When you're working with families, when you're helping them to get the resources, get connected to what they need, that plant A turns into plant B. These are our students that we're working with. They've got opportunity to grow and it's gonna take us to work with them. It's gonna take all the work that you do to represent that water that we see that helped that plant come back to life, which are our students that we're working with. 
again, that resilience, helping them to have those supportive relationships with as many people as possible, but definitely you being that supportive person that they can look to. And being inspiring to those students, you are inspiring whether you realize it or not. Some students may get frustrated, but I'm sure you can think of stories where in the end, the person say, you know what, thank you so-and-so, because if you didn't stay on me, you know, I would not have done X, Y, and Z, or I would not have made it to the, to the finish line, so thank you. And then with our students, that tenacity, getting them to not quit, helping them to understand that the toughest part is to not quit. If they think they're so tough, then don't quit. Show them what it means to be tenacious. If they want to brag about, oh, I'm so I'm tough, I'm tough. Well, how tough are you? Let me see you finish. And then additional tips to help them as they transition back to school. You know, be intentional about letting them know you believe in them. They need someone to believe in them, even if it's just for the small things. And like I said before, acknowledging the small wins is so key. And then when they enroll in school, that connection piece is, is key. I've worked with probation officers in the past to connect the youth to sports, you know, finding out what's this kid's strength. Does this kid like basketball? Let me connect you to the coach. Thank you for giving me the heads up. Now I know I can contact the coach. This kid likes games. Let's get this kid in a gaming club at the school. This kid is a, is a leader. I used to be the peer mediation advisor. I had kids on probation in the peer mediation program because they were leaders. I was helping them to see that you are a leader. I was able to teach them the skills that they need to help resolve conflict on campus, or they didn't think anyone believed in them before and could do that. So these are just a few tips that you can use when you're working with those students. And last but not least, before I turn it over to Elizabeth Clues, I love this quote because it says, if you can lead a gang, you can run a company. If you can write raps, you can write a book. If you can film a street fight, you can shoot a movie. If you can move keys, you can own a trucking company. Don't just take over the block, take over the world. Think about all of your students who have these different talents that they don't realize are talents, how they can turn them into a positive. So I, I just love this. There's a principal in LA who does this with the students. He takes some of the things that are seen as negative and he teaches them about finances and he teaches them how to use their raps and turn them into books and, and publish poetry. So this is my uh, takeaway of something positive to leave with your students. I'm gonna turn it over to the amazing Elizabeth Clues. Hi, um, I just want to start by saying I am so thankful to have this opportunity to speak with you all today. I really value your time and attention as it's really hard for me to be super vulnerable coming from a background of being in foster care and um, being on probation. Um, I... I guess I got involved with um, probation first, probably when I was about 15. Um, my life basically before care and before getting into the system was really tumultuous. My mom had me when she was young. She was a single parent. Um, she was also in the foster care system herself. She struggled in a lot of ways. Being a parent was um, not an innate skill for her. And um you know, my, she was very abusive to me in every capacity. And I want to say when I was about 12 years old, I started running away from home. And when I started running away from home, the police would be called out and eventually they would catch up with me. I always went to school because school is very important to me. It was a safe place to me. Um, and, you know, they would pick me up and take me back home. And I would beg them not to take me back. I would try to tell them what's going on. And, you know, they just kind of said, this is how life is. These, these are your parents, or this is your parent and you don't have anywhere else to be. And so, you know, that created in me very early, a huge distrust in, you know, government entities and law enforcement, because it felt like they thought you were supposed to protect me. Like, why doesn't, why doesn't my life matter? Um, and, you know, so I just continued running away and this became, you know, such a frequent behavior for me. Um, I stopped going to school because I just, I didn't want to go back home. Um, it did, it wasn't a safe environment for me. And so, you know, my mom kind of said, you know, I don't want you to come back here anymore. So I started going to juvenile hall because I was just running away every time I went back home. 
And, you know, it was something that was so strange to me because I didn't know that you could go to juvenile hall for something like that. But, um, you know, it also wasn't that bad for me. I was probably the only person there that was thankful to be there. And I, whenever the judge would be getting ready to send me back home, I'd be very upset because I wanted to stay. Um, and so I want to say, yeah, when I was about 15, I um, went into foster care, um, which was a totally new experience for me. And I did have the nuance where I was both in foster care and on probation. And I would very much argue to say that it's um, very different than simply being one or the other. It's like, you know, you just have all of these other issues. Um, and, you know, I, I had, while well, I was in care, so I, I was in care from the age of 15 until I aged out of foster care, though I technically opted to stay in extended care, which kept me in until about the age of 21. Um, while I was in foster care and underage, I had two different probation officers, um, two of which were, were very lovely people. And, and I feel very fortunate that I did have them assigned to my case. Um, you know, being in foster care and being in probation, which were two very um, new concepts to me, I don't know that I really understood the role of my probation officer. Um, I, I never looked at them as a social worker. Um, when I went into foster care, I went into group home settings. And most of the other girls in my home were simply in, you know, they had social workers. And so it felt like it felt like it was different. It felt like I was different. Um, I didn't see my probation officer as someone who did much more than make sure that I was behaving, um, which really wasn't a huge issue for me. I know when they would come and visit me once a month, it was kind of like, oh, like, you're doing well, like you're going to school, like you're doing what you're supposed to, you know, on the surface. Um, you're following the rules. Great. You know, and on one hand, I felt happy that they did feel a sense of relief when they came and saw me because I was probably for both of them, one of their easier clients. Um, but at the same time, I just felt like there was more to me. There was, I had learned since I started going to juvenile hall that it was just, e I could make it a lot easier on myself if I just did what was asked of me. And so, you know, I felt like in a way I, I became invisible, um, invisible to the people in my home, invisible in the eyes of the system, invisible to society. And I think what I really needed at that time was for someone to really see me, not only to really see me, but to take an interest in the person that I was and the person that I um, was becoming. I, I didn't have a close relationship with my mom. Um, you know, she kind of made me feel like not only was I, you know, good for nothing, but I wasn't also good at anything. And um, one of the areas that I've struggled so much at in my life is um, surrounds my identity because I just, I didn't know who I was. And, um, you know, one thing that I really wish that my both probation officers um, would have done differently was um, I really wish that they would have made a little bit more of an effort to to get to know me as a person. Um, unfortunately, I had the experience of going to 13 different high schools, um, you know, and each, each change, um, I really feel set me back. I didn't typically have very many academic challenges, but I realize now as someone that's 26, as someone that has two young children myself, um, how much I struggle even to this day because nobody ever taught me um, how to how to maintain a healthy relationship, how to become connected, whether in my community or at school or work or wherever I'm at. And because of this, I've, you know, I'm kind of barely getting my life together at almost 30 years old. I'm so happy to be here at all. But I think my journey could have been easier. Um, as, as Kim had mentioned earlier, um, for me, my probation officer was my only point of reference. Um, being in the group homes, they can't really get too close to you. You know, they clock in, they clock out. The next day there's a new staff, high turnover rates. As soon as you get close to someone, no sooner are they replaced. And so, um, you know, I just, I was so confused about the role of my probation officers. And though they were so kind and encouraging, I just, I don't really think they saw through what I wanted to share with them, which is 
everything's great. You know, I was a teenager. I just, I didn't want to be by them. So it's just like, yeah, everything's good. See, like I'm passing my classes. I'm going to school. Everything's fine. But you know, it's just that, um, I'd always been really scared of being vulnerable with other people and, and letting them see the real me because it felt like giving that to someone is, is giving them power, you know? And I just, I wasn't sure if that's, if they were a safe place to do that. I mean, I knew what their job was, but, um, you know, I, I, I didn't know if that was a safe place for me, um, being shuffled around everywhere. Um, one of the biggest things in my life at that time that, you know, really could have affected the trajectory of my life is, um, is that I really didn't have someone to really focus on my educational experience. Though I, I was on probation, my mom still had, um, was still my educational rights holder. And, you know, she didn't care. I didn't hear from her almost the whole time that I was in care. And so, you know, I was always trying to advocate for myself school to school, like, hey, like, these are my transcripts. This doesn't look right. I, I've already taken this class four times. Like, I don't want to take this class again, or I'm missing credits. Can you please call, you know, can you please call my old school so they can verify it for you? Um, there was one school I was only in for two days and I was marked as having Fs, which lowered my total GPA. And I hardly even went to that school. I mean, I was only there for two days and, you know, it was just really hard continuing to try to fight for myself and say what what was right and what I experienced and to just have everyone around me, you know, not really believe me, not really validate my experience. And when I turned 18 in December of 2012 and in my last group home, I was given the option of staying in care until I graduated school in the next six months or leaving. And according to my transcripts, I was so far behind, I wasn't going to graduate on time. And, you know, I felt like, well, why would I, why would I stay here if I can go have freedom. Like, I'll just figure that out by myself. And when I get back to LA, where I'm from, and, you know, it didn't turn out that way. And many years later, after finding a mentor in the community that was willing to go back through my transcripts with me, I found that at that time, I only had one credit that I needed to graduate. And if I had known that, that would have looked like me going to college immediately after high school, which is something that I always dreamed of, but had felt at that time was just simply unattainable. And, you know, nobody really took notice of that. And, you know, I'm in such a better place now and things are getting better, but it, it took a long time and it took many mistakes to get to this place. And if there's anything that I could change about the system or what happened during that time in my life, I just, I wish that somebody really took the reins and really felt a personal responsibility to my outcome. I wish they looked at me with the same eyes that they would look at their own child because at that time I had nobody to look at me or to see me at all. Thank you. Thank you so much for being vulnerable, Elizabeth, and sharing your story with us because you shared some tips and I'm sure that we all have something that we can take away from it. So I think you're so strong, resilient, and courageous. And I just wanna thank you so much for sharing that. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lustig. I'm going to just take a moment to breathe. Um, powerful words always, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for your bravery and your resilience and sharing um, and, and, and helping us all to think about how we can continue to do better by the young people that we serve. So thank you. Um, next slide, please. So we wanted to just share with you some things you may or may not be aware of. Um, I am putting um, a, a link in the chat that um, will may be helpful for you if you wanna um, copy that and save it someplace. Um, but it helps to define which children in all of our different systems are eligible for different types of entitlements. And I just share that as a reference. But I wanna just talk with you for a few minutes about the educational rights of your students who are on probation and also in foster care and let you know that some of these entitlements are even available and, and afforded to your students who are not and never have been in placement through your department or through the Child Welfare Authority that are just 602s um, that were enrolled in a juvenile court and community school. 
So the first is, is that all of our students um, really are entitled to and need to be afforded equal access to a full and comprehensive education. Because a child has been adjudicated, that does not in any way, shape, or form translate to them being required to go to an alternative education school, a juvenile court and community school, or another restrictive setting. If their offense uh, included an expulsion, that's a very different thing. But as a student is released from juvenile hall, released from incarceration, they are actually required to return to the last public comprehensive school they were enrolled in. Every school district has an AB 490 foster care liaison, a point person in the district office who is available to help provide supports and services um, to students who are eligible for those entitlements. Um, what school the student goes to is a decision that is to be made in the student's best interest, never at the convenience of the placement um, or anybody else for that matter. And all of those decisions are made by the student's educational rights holder and in their best interest. You heard Elizabeth speak about how her mom remained her educational rights holder, although she really had no contact with her. You as probation officers have the authority and responsibility to determine if the person who is making educational decisions for your probationers is the right person, is the person who is qualified to do so, is invested in doing so, is engaged with the important aspects of a child's education, and you can recommend to the court that somebody else be appointed via the JV 535 process, um, which is a court form. Um, and those conversations should be happening at court hearings as well. Um, children are entitled to remain in their school of origin. That's the school they last attended when before they went into placement. Um, the school that they were last at before they changed placements or any school that they feel connected to, felt successful at um, in the preceding 15 months. Anytime there is a dispute around where a child should be going to school, what school they should be enrolled in, while we all as the adults figure out that dispute, they are entitled to remain in the school that they are attending, where they want to be enrolled, where they may be experiencing success, we hope. Um, until we get that dispute resolved. They don't get to bounce, they don't have to bounce around while we figure it out. Um, they, if they have to change schools, they are required to, they are entitled to immediate enrollment, even if their records are missing, even if they don't have um, immunization records handy, if they owe fees or fines to a prior school because of lost materials, or they don't have the school uniform that's required, the school must enroll them immediately and work out those other issues later. And immediate enrollment doesn't mean enrolled and sitting in the library waiting for folks to figure out where to put them. And it doesn't mean sitting in the principal's office and it doesn't mean sitting on that bench out in front of the main office. It means enrolled and engaged in academic pursuits in a classroom, learning. And they have credit protection. So you heard um, Elizabeth also speak about how as she was nearing the end of her time in our systems, she felt she had a whole lot of credits that were uh, missing and she couldn't graduate when in fact she only was missing one. Um, there is a responsibility on the part of the districts, both those the child previously attended and those they are enrolling into, um, to put together pieces and parts of credits um, so that they can get all of, the re all of the credits that they deserve and also um, that they not be um, penalized for uh, absences that are because of court appearances or family visitation and things of that nature, that their credits and their academic transcripts um, are preserved. Next slide, please. Um, you, as probation officers and the placing authority, have access to their records. Um, you can get whatever information you need for your case planning, for your work with that child and family, that would include attendance records, which can be so important. Often a condition of probation is that the child go to school. Um, that information should be accessible to you. You should be able to um, have access to that as you need it. Um, there are uh, provisions that allow for children who are, aside from ever having been in placement, 
if they have ever attended a juvenile court and community school, um, that they are immediately entitled to a waiver for additional local high school graduation requirements. If they meet some other criteria, certain other criteria, they've completed the second year of high school and an analysis has been conducted that they couldn't, without this assistance, graduate with their class. So if let's say you have a student who changes schools, they're now a junior, they're in their third year and they only have 70 or 80 credits, they can just complete the state high school graduation requirements, which is a total of 130 credits and graduate with a high school diploma. We really advise that this be looked at as dropout prevention because they are being deprived of a good chunk of curriculum that they won't have access to. In addition, if the student is incarcerated, once they complete high school, they don't go to school anymore. So if you have a student who's 17 and wants to graduate under the waiver, but may do that in six months prior to being 18 and they'll be incarcerated through 18, um, there's gonna be potentially an issue of them not being able to attend school during that portion of their incarceration. And, and we want folks to be aware of that as well. If your students are being um, suspended and moving towards expulsion, there is a requirement that you be notified of that. Um, you don't have to attend those proceedings, but you do need to be noticed along with the child's attorney. Um, if your student is in placement, then they are entitled to transportation to their school of origin, and you may want to be talking in your local jurisdictions about um, mutual cost sharing agreements that your child welfare partners may already have and you might want to become a part of. Um, another really important thing that folks don't think about is that when our students, those that are considered in foster care move from place to place, they have automatic CIF eligibility to play. They don't have to establish residency. And while that may seem sort of outside the sphere of education or academics, many of us know that the one thing that got us to go to school was that we got to play sports. And we got to feel successful and accomplished because we had athletic ability. And so for students to be able to immediately play, go out for a team and play, that can be a really important factor with having them invested in school. We've provided a couple of links to the California Foster Youth Education Task Force uh, fact sheets that list all of these entitlements in much better detail than I was able to go over with you today. And we also wanted to just very quickly make sure you were aware of something that, your, that, that we as the technical assistance team has created and is available to you, which is the resource hub. And I don't know, Kim, if we can click on that very quickly just to show it if that's possible. If not, I encourage you to look after. But this is a public facing website that has an enormous amount of resources and information available to everybody who is supporting students um, in foster care or on probation. There are resources specific to children who are um, under a 602 petition, and there are amazing trauma-informed resources. All of the events are listed that we host. Um, please, I encourage you to look at it as you are thinking about um, supporting your students in foster care and your students on probation in their education. So it is a free resource. We update it frequently and it is available to you and your colleagues. And I believe I am going to turn that over, uh, back uh, over to the lesson to Callie. Hello, thank you, Michelle. So I am Callie Oxford from Lassen County Foster Youth Services Program. Go ahead, Kim. So who are we? Statewide, we are county operated. Um, we are housed at the probation department. So unlike any other foster youth services program, we are not at the county office. We are based out of the probation department. Um, myself, Callie, and then not here, but Tiffany Bernardino is a probation assistant for the program. Go ahead, Kim. Why are we here? Poor educational outcomes, high dropout rates, low test scores, low graduation rates, and high rates of school mobility. And then there is a little bit of data on the side there. 
that goes into more detail. I can't see that far. Okay. Go ahead, Kim. How did we get here? AB 490, ESSA, LCFF, and AB 854. Go ahead, Kim. There, right here. So who is considered a foster youth? AB 490, any child who is the subject of a juvenile dependency court, whether or not the child has been removed from his or her home. LCFF, any child who is a subject of a juvenile dependency court petition, whether or not the child has been removed from his or her home. Any child who is a subject of a juvenile delinquency court petition and who has been removed from his or her home. And then AB 12, AB 12, any youth aged 18 to 21 who is under the jurisdiction of a juvenile court. Go ahead, Kim. What we do. So we provide educational case management services to foster youth. Uh, monthly meetings with foster youth, meetings with school staff, caseworkers, we attend IEPs and CFTs. We track attendance and grades. Uh, we have access to most of our districts, school wise, CalPads, whatever they use. Um, for their accounts, we keep access to those to track grades and attendance to provide to social workers and probation officers. Go ahead, Kim. Facilitate collaboration, uh, ensure coordinated and non-duplicated services are delivered. We partner with Plumas County to host a local youth empowerment summit every year. Go ahead, Kim. We keep records for the health and education passport. We provide services, tutoring, mentoring, and independent living program. Our, ooh, nope, you're okay. <laughs> uh, so our tutoring program is one of our biggest things here in Lassen County. It is a classroom style tutoring, so we do not offer it one-on-one -on -one anymore. This school year, we served 43 foster youth services tutoring, which was a huge increase from the last couple years. Go ahead, Kim. Uh, Post-secondary education, we assist in school admission, FAFSA, uh, Pell Grant, campus tours, capacity building. We provide trainings to social workers, probation officers, school staff in Lassen County uh, free of charge. We assist in the LCAP and we meet quarterly with uh, Lassen County Office of Ed. Go ahead, Kim. So main thing, how we differ. Uh, like I said in the beginning, the program is ran out of the probation department. Uh, we have a standing MOU with county agencies, which allows data sharing and communication. So I have access to probation database, child welfare database, uh, school database, it does not differ where I work. So that is, yeah, basically how it is different than any other department. The Lassen County Foster Youth Services Program started in 2003 with a grant from the California Department of Education. The Probation Department, in partnership with the Lassen County Office of Education, set out to provide services for vital record collection, timely school enrollment, and to improve educational outcomes for foster youth in Lassen County. This coordinator was a part-time employee managing and providing services to 50 foster youth, 11 school districts, and 24 schools. All 58 counties in California have a foster youth services program, but Lassen County is the only one to operate the program at the probation department. Most foster youth have high dropout rates, low test scores, high rates of school mobility from placement moves, and decreased rates of entering post-secondary education. The goal is to improve those rates for all foster youth in Lassen County. Ten years later, the Foster Youth Services Program underwent a redesign to provide more specific and comprehensive services to meet the current needs of the population. Lester Ruda, FYS Program Coordinator and then Program Assistant Callie Oxford took the program from an additional duty as assigned to a multifaceted partnership focused on helping foster youth succeed. The program provides capacity building services to give educators, youth, parents, service providers, and community members the knowledge to help youth find career paths, overcome educational barriers, and participate in individualized education programs. 
The program also assists with difficult behavior, checking in with foster youth to ensure they are meeting educational goals and mentoring youth aging out of the system. During the redesign, Lester was thrown into a small planning group of four people from both Lassen and Plumas counties for a youth education summit. YES is a collaborative camp event supported by several agencies representing multiple counties to provide educational, motivational, coping, and life skills to foster youth, parents, and service providers. A small group quickly grew into a collaborative, defined the purpose and mission of the camp, and then refined the program with a focus on helping high-risk youth succeed. YES, or Youth Education Summit also focuses on giving care providers and important adults in a younger person's life the tools they need to help you succeed. Tutoring was enhanced to reach more students, be multifaceted, and create budget savings to provide more services. Tutoring was traditionally provided on an individual basis and was limited to a small number of students. Creating a classroom-style system of tutoring will increase the number of youth participating in the program. Foster Youth Service staff focus on attendance in school to decrease the number of absences due to participation in services to reduce the reason the youth is in care. Foster Youth often attend behavioral health, substance abuse, or medical appointments during the school day. Tutoring will assist in making up assignments and homework, and FYS will continue advocating for youth to be enrolled in services outside of the school day when possible. Capacity building amongst the service and education providers, families, and the community became a focus. Foster Youth Services provides free training in the areas of trauma-informed care, legal issues, alternatives to higher education, and increasing outcomes for foster youth. Creative budgeting and utilizing local resources keep the cost of these trainings so low there is no charge. These trainings help everyone in the community working with foster youth understand the challenges these youth present, the barriers they face, and how we can help them succeed. It also helps send the message about success being an individual vision and not the service providers or the traditional belief of what success is. Once most of the service changes were complete, it was time to let everyone in Lawson County know about the Foster Youth Services Program. We partnered with Kudso Technologies to design a logo, social media connectors, website, educational materials, and marketing for our message. Video success stories were implemented to gain the perspective of things youth experience in foster care and the resource families. Educating everyone in our community has increased the number of referrals we receive for services and advocacy. So that is all I have. If anybody has any questions, or I don't know if we're waiting till the end, I will actually give that back to Kim. Thank you, Callie. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Elizabeth. Thank you. This Elizabeth, the, the less articulate Elizabeth. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, this has really, really been a great uh, informative and um, compelling uh, discussion. So thanks for combining those. Um, as I mentioned in the chat earlier, we spent kind of the beginning of the conference talking about hope and the, the importance of setting goals and the role that that can play. And so it really ties into uh, what you all are talking about in this conference. Um, I do encourage people, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat and or please feel free to uh, raise your hand. We have about 20 minutes left, so we have time for some question and answer. Um, I've actually gotten a couple of questions, so I'll go ahead and start, but you don't have to direct message me. You can, you can, you can put them in the chat to everyone if you, if you want. Um, but uh, one question is, can counties have more than one uh, foster youth uh, services coordinator? Seems like some counties uh, might need more than one. Um, so each county office of education that has students in foster care have an FYSCP funded grant program. There's one person who's designated as the lead of that, but many of them, such as Los Angeles, have multiple coordinators that work under that person and in collaboration with that person to provide support at a more regional level or in different man different ways. So each program is designed a little bit different. 
but there's that's the county office program. There is always for every school district a foster care liaison that is in the district office of each and every school district as well. And those positions often work very closely with that county office foster youth services program. Are there any tips for probation officers if they don't have it as, as well integrated as Lassen County um, does for how to um, best access those services? I would strongly recommend that somebody in your probation uh, department, often the, the folks who work in the placement units or for those children who are in placement um, are the right individuals, though sometimes it's a, a deputy or other, to participate in the executive advisory council that each foster youth services program must have. And those, those councils should include the all agencies and all collaborative partners that are supporting the students that that program is, is um, supposed to be supporting and is providing supports to. That would be a way for them to sort of be a part of all of those really significant conversations. Um, we can provide to you a list of who the leads for every FYSCP program is, Elizabeth, for you to share with the field so that each county will know, um, each person on probation, everybody will know working within their probation departments who to reach out to at the county office to be included in those discussions. That would probably be the, the, clean, the, the most direct way. Great, thank you. That would be really um, helpful. And then I, I think um, Michelle, when you started uh, speaking, many of us were still um, uh, processing uh, Elizabeth's really powerful comments. And I think um, you know, sort of taking that to heart and reflecting on our own on our own work. And so I confess that there may be some aspects of what you mentioned that I might have missed as others might have as well. Um, and so one of the topics that I know has come up in questions has to do with the credit earning for graduation and that, you know, that is a possibility um, that students can take advantage of, but that there might sometimes be a reason not to. And so I'm, I'm wondering, we have a few minutes, like, can you help us kind of think through from the role of assisting youth on probation, kind of one, what the, what the possibilities are, but two, how to, how to think through the advantages and disadvantages of taking, uh, taking that opportunity. Absolutely. So the, the, there's a couple of just fundamental things. Um, first, you know, to graduate at the state minimum requirements, it's 130 credits. It's about 100 credits, give or take less than a full high school education. So think about how many courses, how much information, how much knowledge isn't going to be provided to that student. Uh, important consideration is what the student wants for their future. If that student wants to go to a four-year public university in California, they are not going to be qualified to do so. They are going to have to go the community college route um, for higher education. And even at the community college level, they likely will have significant deficits in their skill set to be able to be successful. However, if you have a student who is just going to walk away from their education if they, you know, because they're so behind, because they have not attended, because they had so much missed education or so much school failure, and they are willing to engage enough to get that diploma at 130 credits, that could really be a win. And it could really set them up to engage in career technical programming, both at the high school level and the community college level, with a lot of other career trajectories that could be really meaningful, rewarding, and help them have a future where they can provide for themselves. Um, but as I said, when I was uh, speaking earlier, if the child is incarcerated and will be incarcerated through their 18th birthday or beyond, that legislation, that entitlement also affords a, 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 an absolute entitlement to a fifth year of high school to complete all local requirements. So you also have this other opportunity for a student who may well be working with you and the Department of Probation through age 21 to remain engaged in their high school education. And all of that 
can be considered and should be considered as the decisions are being made about whether or not to take that, that waiver option. Another thing that's important is the student can, using that example at the start of their junior year, say, no, I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to take the waiver. They have an entitlement to reconsider that again if in the future they feel off track and they don't, um, they don't think they're going to complete. So it, it's not a make the decision right this moment or you lose any opportunity to have it. It can be more iterative and you can reconsider it again um, with the student as they continue on their education so that you're focusing on what's going to help them remain in school, prevent them from dropping out and have them complete with some level of success. Great, thank you. Um, and I am getting some follow up questions. Again, encourage people to uh, go ahead and add them um, to the chat. So, so uh, who makes the AB 167 high school uh, credit determination? Uh, within 30 days of the student enrolling in school, uh, a school counselor or another designee should be assessing the student's credits, where they're at, what they've completed, what still remains based on the local high school requirements where they're currently enrolled, and within those 30 days needs to notify the educational decision maker, the educational rights holder and the student of whether or not they are determined to be eligible for that waiver. At that time, that educational rights holder and the student decide, are they going to accept the waiver? Are they going to say no thank you? Um, and, and what will happen? If, um, as I said, if they decide not to take it right now, that's okay. They can be reassessed again in the future. Um, but ultimately, it is the person who holds the student's educational rights who decides. And again, that goes back to what we also talked about. Think about Elizabeth telling us that her mom continued to be the educational rights decision maker and rights holder, but wasn't really engaged in her life. So who makes that decision becomes very important when we're thinking about that state minimum graduation requirement versus local graduation requirement. So there's an, another question sort of tied to this, but also really connected to um, the, the what Elizabeth shared with us um, in terms of her personal story. What, what resources are available to foster youth as they're trying to figure out their school records and get them cleared up, clarified? Um, school counselors should be a resource for them. Their foster youth services um, partner, you know, the folks at the FYS office at the County Office of Ed should absolutely be working collaboratively to help with that. Um, school counselors we know are really overloaded and have huge caseloads, but that really is their role. Um, ideally, the AB 490 school district liaison is involved in that and in ensuring that someone at the school site level is able to do it or in small school districts, um, maybe a school district that has one high school, it may well be the AB 490 school district liaison who is doing that. Um, I strongly encourage though, if any probation officer ever has a question uh, about who's doing that or who should do that or who could do that to reach out to their foster youth services program or that school district liaison to find out and to make sure that that child is on their radar and, um, and kind of have that conversation. Um, we obviously, as part of the CCR conference and as part of the CCR work, talk a lot about CFTs. Um, is there a role that the foster youth coordinator should be playing in CFTs? Um, that depends a lot on the jurisdiction, and I can tell you that in many jurisdictions, the FYSCP program is noticed and invited to the CFTs. Um, some, in some jurisdictions, they, they make the connection to the right person at the school or school district to participate um, in the CFT process and in the meeting. So that really varies and is very um, locally driven based on agreements. Um, if there are interagency agreements that include provisions around CFT participation in very large jurisdictions, 
the foster youth services program may be much more disconnected from the day-to-day -day educational life of the student than someone at the school site. And so they would really be the right person to participate and bring, or to provide information. Um, though often the foster youth services programs are the um, kind of conduit to how the child's doing in school and in ensuring that the right person is, is participating. Um, what about IEP or 504 meetings? Should the probation officers um, or the social workers in, in the Institute of Child Welfare be required to attend um, those meetings? Um, they would be an additional participant. I don't, uh, certainly when I was a social worker, I attended my, my kids' IEPs. I wanted to know what was going on, um, but I had a residential high-end smaller caseload and could do that. Um, I encourage it. I think it's important. I think it is uh, another concerned adult in the room holding everyone accountable for the child's needs being identified and met, and they are making progress on their IEPs or 504 plans as they've been designed. Um, so I, I think that that's a really important role to play. I will say that in many county offices, the foster youth services team members do not attend those meetings. Um, there are in some jurisdictions conflicts of interest because the SELPA, the special, the special education local plan area office is also the county office and they don't want to step on each other's toes in special ed proceedings. But I certainly think it's a, an, a if, if, a, if, a, if you're available to, that attending could be very, very helpful. And uh, what about college? Is there assistance available for youth in foster care and uh, transition to college or college applications? Absolutely. I think every single foster youth services program does provide those kinds of transitional services. There's also a lot of resources and support available through California College Pathways which is a project of the John Burton Advocates for Youth Foundation. Um, that is a place you'll see those resources. There are college and career supports on the resource hub link that we shared. There's a whole tab for that. Um, students who are coming out of our systems are, have a whole array of entitlements and supports available to them in the higher education sector. Um, and so they, things like, you know, registering for classes early, um, on-campus housing and such that they are entitled to. So it is important that we make those connections. There are campus support programs on most of our public university campuses and in all of the 109 community colleges throughout California that students can be connected to so that they can learn how to navigate um, a college campus program. Um, so those, those services are definitely out there. Um, if there's any question about the resources that, uh, and the responsiveness of you all, as you are talking, Kim is like putting into the chat the, the resource links for this. So thank you very much, uh, Kim, for the, the, the very real time uh, connection to services. I uh, appreciate that. And if folks don't have their chat open, I encourage you to take a look at those links. Um, so we, we, we sort of uh, framed this session with the idea that, you know, uh, many youth are going to be uh, returning to in-person education if they haven't already. Um, and we clearly spent um, some time talking about the trauma um, that the youth with whom we're working are already facing. What recommendations, and Michelle, this is for you, for Kim, for Elizabeth, uh, for any of you, for uh, Chief uh, Branning, for Callie, what recommendations do you all have for helping youth with the emotional um, stress that they may face as they return to school um, from the perspective of the folks who are in this workshop and the role that they uh, might play with in these youth lives. Um, one thing I've been encouraging um, counselors to do is when students return or when students, when they get new students on their campus to find out what are 
uh, some of their triggers. For example, what do some students, what kind of support, if students can and can let them know, you know what, when I'm frustrated, this is what I tend to do, or here's, here's a person that I talk to, a, a mentor, someone that really helps me. Um, just being proactive about asking them that information so that in the event that the student is struggling emotionally or, or they need some additional help that, and they don't have immediate access to a clinical counselor or someone, maybe the school can contact uh, that person to, to reach out to whoever the youth said is that supportive adult in their life. And sometimes it might be the probation officer, or like I said earlier, if you're helping a student transition back into school and you're having a conversation with the counselor, maybe giving them a heads up about some things that they're able to share, you know, as it relates to what the student needs. We know the students are receiving wraparound services, so sometimes it can be an overload if they're receiving a lot of counseling outside of school already. And if the school doesn't know that and the school's like, well, we're going to give you counseling inside, kids can, can shut down a little bit. But as they transition back to school, what I found that works in the past is when students feel comfortable being the kid on probation and, and my counselor knows or, or my teacher knows and they embrace it and try to support me instead of feeling like, oh, this kid is on my caseload. And sometimes that takes that conversation and I've encouraged probation officers to really be intentional about reaching out to that counselor because the history of the communication between schools and child welfare, it hasn't been the greatest, but maybe um, sending an email as it heads up saying, hey, I'm, I'm a person that you can contact. I'm here to support this amazing youth that's coming to your school, even using those positive words in the beginning, just helping with that emotional support as they transition back. I, I would also just add, I think, you know, for many of our kids, as you um, as you've heard today, school isn't always you know the most welcoming place, and so for some of our kids, we are going to see an increase of school in school refusal. They want they're going to want to remain virtual and online because they haven't had to literally tolerate feeling unwanted in school environments. Want you know feeling. Um, like they were being targeted or that they were receiving disproportionate discipline referrals. Um, so really being, I think, you know, just accepting that that's, that may well be a natural consequence of the pandemic, that they may be asking to not have to return to those environments. And I do think that that's going to be an opportunity to learn some things that we may not have known that they were experiencing in their school sites and in their school experience and have that be a starting point for where, where we support them differently, where we address those concerns, where we acknowledge what that might feel like and, and how do we get to where Kim is talking about where as opposed to feeling targeted or not wanted, they're feeling embraced and welcomed. And what does that look like? And enlisting our partners in education um, and across systems to create those environments and those pathways for them. You know, I would say that one of the benefits of our program in Lassen County um, is our tutoring program. Um, throughout the entire uh, pandemic, our schools, um, they never uh, closed down for more than a couple of weeks at a time, but our tutoring, we increased that and we um, had Zoom tutoring and then we went right back to in-person tutoring and what we found is our tutors really became mentors and created a pathway for school engagement with our foster youth um, when they have a bad day or they have questions that they didn't feel were answered they were able to uh, bring that to their tutor um, after school and really work through some of that some of the tutors or teachers at the um, school and they're on campus and they were able to help those students go engage with the teacher um, to change the outcome and to change the interaction they had. So we've really seen um, that positive increase in school engagement and interactions with other positive adults at schools. That's a great suggestion and I I can imagine ways of building this into the kind of positive rewards that we've been also uh, thinking and talking about. Um, is there anything else anyone else uh, wants to add? 
uh, any strategies that uh, attendees want to go ahead and share with us, ideas, thoughts, uh, feel free to add them to the chat. And if not, Chief Branning, I am going to uh, turn it back over to you to close it out. Um, and uh, just on behalf of, uh, well, yeah, I'm going to let you do this. It's hard not to say thank you, though. <laughs> but I'll let you do it. I really want to thank um, all of our presenters. You've done an amazing job. Um, this is such an important topic, and I know it's one um, that we really like to focus on is to see educational success uh, for better future outcomes. Um, I'd like to thank all of the participants for joining us um, for our conference and for this uh, particular uh, presentation, as it means a lot, um, especially to our foster youth. Um, I want to thank Elizabeth Clues for her story um, and for sharing that with us so that we get a better perspective of what it feels like. Um, please remember that you will be receiving evaluations for the conference by email. These are really important in helping us plan next year's conference so that we can design it to your needs and wants. Um, I would also like to remind you that the conference platform is going to be available to everyone for one month. And after that, the recordings um, and the slides will be available on CPOC's website. Uh, outside of that, I really wanna thank everybody for spending their time with us um, over the past three days. Um, it means a lot to us and we want to thank you as this concludes our fifth annual Continuum of Care Reform Conference. And I would also like to give one final thank you to all of the staff at the Chief Probation Officers of California. They have done an amazing job putting on yet again, a second virtual conference. So thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day.